of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. And I guess that's true. It didn't matter, but there are many, many, many listed there where they've been on the Sabbath. Number four, the issue of the Sabbath Sunday question is loyalty to God versus loyalty to the little horn. That's true. Who are we going to obey? Whoever we obey, obey is who we actually worship. That's what it amounts to. And so the Sabbath Sunday is worship and obey God or the little horn. Because Sunday came from the little horn power. The New Testament records many instances where the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. And that is true. That goes back to the 84, remember, right? Okay. Now, I've heard this through the years. Um, maybe you have too. A common question frequently asked at this time is, if Scripture is so clear, how can the ministers... Sorry about that. I'm not doing what we all should do. <laughs> Turn down the... The sound... There we go. A common question is, you know, if the scripture is so clear, how can ministers, evangelists, and their followers not accept it? Well, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. That's, that's the verse that gives us uh, really a, a description of why. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. There's the key. Love the truth, that they might be saved. But they didn't. And so he goes on to say, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but at pleasure and unrighteousness. So, we need to have the desire to really want to know the truth. Because there's a couple things that, that can work against us when it comes to truth. One can be presupposed ideas. You know, we may grow up with certain teachings, it's in our mind. And I know for myself, I grew up, even though I didn't go to church, I was raised with the idea of Sundays, the day you go to church. And when I started learning about the Sabbath, uh, you know, it didn't seem right. So I had some presupposed beliefs. And as I studied it, then I began seeing it with my intellect. It seemed to be true. But then I told you the story. I still didn't believe they were telling me the truth. So I went and studied out for myself, went to the library, went to Catholic priest. Once I would prove it to myself, Saturday's the seventh day Sabbath, then I said, okay, I'm going to, even though Sunday felt right, I can't go on feelings. you got to go on what the Word says. I'll give you another example. Sometimes when you ask for forgiveness, you won't feel forgiven. You still feel bad. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so sorry I did that. Don't go on feelings. If God said he'll forgive you, you're forgiven if you ask God to forgive you. So we don't want to go on feelings in that sense in our relationship with Christ. So when I saw it in my mind from God's word, from history, my own research, I said, okay, that seems to be it. And I went forward in what I saw to be truth. And in due time, now Sabbath feels right. And it would feel odd going to church on Sunday. So that can be a barrier, is, is feelings are presupposed, whatever I did. I did. I hate to ask this question. It is with regard to question number three. Question three? Yeah. It talks about Paul, he's, he, he kept Sabbath 84. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Time. You read about different yeah. times. That's, that's only a year and a half of Sabbath, right? <laughs> but it didn't record every time. In other words, what you're doing in the book of Acts, and even in the Gospels, I think there's one scripture that says Jesus did so much, if it was all written down, you know, there wouldn't be enough room to put it. So, we've got recorded in the Gospels oh, okay. Okay. so much, we got in the book of Acts so much, okay. 
And so it's not everything yeah. recorded. Okay, but after he was knocked off that beast on the road to Damascus, he kept, yeah. he kept the Sabbath till the yeah. end of his life. Right, he was still keeping the Sabbath. Yes. Okay, okay. That's right. Okay. okay, so the key is wanting truth. Uh, loving the truth, wanting to follow the truth. And by the way, it's only God that puts in our heart the desire. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit convicting us to want to obey Him, follow truth. And another thing, sometimes when we come across truth, it cuts across our lifestyle for some reason, you know. Maybe there's something we like to do, but we study the Bible, and we find out the Bible says you really shouldn't do that. Now what am I going to do? Again, so that can create a conflict. Um, and so we got to make a choice. Am I going to choose to put the Bible above a certain aspect of my life maybe that I liked before? So that's why this key, love the truth, putting truth number one. And if we don't, Satan will often lead us into be deceived. Now, I guess you can read that. I don't like the rest of you this sometimes. Today people want love. This I've heard been through many years too. Well, it's just love. Just love. Doctrine is not really that important. Well, let's look at a few texts here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You're in uh, Thessalonians, so to the right of where you're at. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So God wants us to know the doctrines, the teachings of the Bible. It says for reproof and correction, uh, Bible doctrine will correct us, will instruct us in God's way, so that, like he says there, we'll be thoroughly furnished, we'll have all that we need in order to serve God faithfully. And then notice the uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 to 4. You're right here already. He's, this is Paul, by the way, writing to a young preacher, Timothy. This is Paul writing this, but it's to Timothy. He's saying, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. So Paul knew there'd be a time you'd have to present doctrine so individuals would understand the teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, there's some people, they'll go hear teachings that appeal to what they like. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily cut across. Cut across. Uh, because like you said, after their own lusts, their own desires, um, so they'll, they'll follow things that's, that they prefer over and above what the Word says. And they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So there's warnings. Warnings in Thessalonians and Timothy. The importance of doctrine and of following the doctrines or teachings of the Bible. And I won't read any more of those. They're along the same, same line. So it is through doctrines that we learn and understand the character of God. Now let's do some review because we're on Daniel 8 and 9 tonight. And remember, I've told you about the Bible principle of repeat and enlarge. God will give a teaching, and then he'll repeat it and enlarge upon it, and repeat it and enlarge upon it. Now, we've studied Daniel 2, and we studied Daniel 7. Those are two prophecies of world history. They repeat the same time period using different symbols, and they give you a little more information on each one. So, and then... The reason God does this, he wants us to know these things. <laughs> because he can give us confidence in the Bible, confidence in him. And in the world we live in, I'm glad God is sovereign God and he's in control. It may not look like it, but he is. And that's what prophecy can 
confirmed in our belief. God is sovereign. God's in control. Even though Satan's doing a lot, he's only doing it by God allowing him to. So, look at these different prophecies. The first one was Daniel 2. You remember the statue of a man, and the head was of gold, that was Babylon, chest and arms of silver, Medo Persia, dual empire there, stomach and thighs of brass or bronze, that's Greece, and they developed the use of uh, bra uh, brass weapons. Legs of iron, Rome developed the use of iron in their weapons. And then you see Rome was divided into two empires, Eastern and Western Roman Empire. And then you get down to the feet of iron and clay, well that's Rome was totally divided among the nations of Europe. And so that's where we're living today, the feet of iron and clay, nations of Europe. Remember what happened next? Stone came, that was the coming of, of Christ. So that's the next event in this prophecy that happened. Now, I also mentioned to you in this study, God coming and destroying the nations, the time of the feet and iron and clay, what does it tell us about the nations? They will be allied against God. Because he wouldn't destroy them if they were seeking to follow God. So right here is an indication that at the end of time, there will be a strong unity in the world against God. And as we've been studying, we know it's against God and His law. Uh, Satan hates the law of God. Now, when we go to the next uh, this is Daniel 7. You got the same nations except different symbols. Here you've got the lion with wings is Babylon. That's one of their symbols in archaeology, by the way. The next nation, Greece, a leopard with wings, a very fast animal. With wings, four heads. The four heads represent the four generals that took Alexander's place when he died. A bear raised up on one side, Medo Persia, that conquered Greece. And then this terrible beast with iron teeth, Rome, and the iron legs. And it had ten horns, just like the statue would have ten toes. This has ten horns, the nations of Europe, not Rome. And then you had a little horn come up. And when the little horn came up, remember it up through, through uprooted three of the ten. And we've gone through that history. So, when we get into the lesson for tonight, we're going to move into now Daniel 8. And Daniel 8 will repeat the same sequence of history. Except we're going to see, it's going to start uh, with, uh, not with Babylon, and the, that's why in this lesson it'll tell you the first nation that's mentioned. So to start with, uh, the panorama of empires, empires here, when did Daniel have the vision of, of eight? Um, Daniel eight. No, let's go to Daniel eight, verse one and two. Eight, verse one and two. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even to me Daniel, after which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw a vision, and it came to pass when I saw it, it was the Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision, and it was by the river of Eli. So it was in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So it's near the end of the Babylonian Empire that this was that he was given this vision. What kind of animal did Daniel see in vision that conquered in every direction? Verse 3 and 4. And I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high. But one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw a ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. So what did he see? A ram, which had two horns. 
Now, because this prophecy does not begin as the previous two did, God tells us who this is. So let's go over here. Who does the ram represent? Verse 20. He says that the ram which you saw having two horns for the kings of Medo Persia. And so this, it was just about time for Babylon to fall. And Medo Persia was on the horizon, coming up in power and about to overthrow Babylon. So this is the first power mentioned here. And mentioned too, it's the Medo Persia. So that's the answer there. Kings of Medo Persia. Question in, verse, in chapter 5. Uh, was Belshazzar's fall. So Daniel is now writing uh, something that happened before that Belshazzar's yeah. fall. Yeah, because it had so yeah. it's going back. And sometimes in the Bible you don't, it's not in perfect sequence. You'll find that in the book of Revelation. They'll take it so far, then it'll flash it back a little bit, and then it'll flash it back. So that's kind of what you got here. Um, so here's your empire. You've got Peter of Persia. And you see the extent. Now the next day I'm always saw Daniel 8 verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So here he saw a goat from the west. And the question is, what about the goat? He had a notable horn between his eyes. And who does this represent? Verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Greece, Grecia, Greece. And the great horn is between his eyes, the first king. So it's Greece. I remember what direction the prophecy said this empire came from? The west. And Greece is west of the other, you know, Babylon and Medo Persia and all that. So Greece, and, and you notice each of these empires are expanding a little more. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece. And so you've got this um, the goat is Greece, the notable horn, the first king. Remember who the conqueror was? Alexander. Alexander the Great. That's right. Very young. Conquered. What did the goat do to the ram? Verse 6 and 7. And he came to the ram and had two horns, which had that was seen standing before the river, and ran to him with fury of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram. He was moved with color against him and smote the ram and break his two horns. There was no power in the ram to stand for him, but it cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver him out of his hand. So he conquered the ram. One thing I have to mention to you here, as you have if, as you've studied your lesson. At the end of the lesson, it talks about the sanctuary. And, and we won't get into the details of that tonight. That's what's coming next, several lessons. But it's interesting to note here, the animals used in this prophecy are related to the sanctuary service. Ram, goat, so forth. Where Daniel 7 are animals which are vicious animals, representing the war side of these. But you see here animals that were, were used in some of the different um, services of the sanctuary and Daniel 8 ends up focusing on the sanctuary. And that's in part why these particular animals were chosen. What happened to the great horn when it was strong? And what came up in its place? Verse 8. Therefore the goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So what happened? Broken. 
Alexander the Great <coughs> died very young. He was in his 30s. And you know what always amazes me? How exact God is. He knew that these things would happen. <laughs> and he used symbolism to point it out. And what happened? Four other horns came up in its place. And that's where you've got the meaning of these. Now it's verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in its own power. So you got four horns are four kingdoms. So Alexander's empire, he died. Four generals then took over different territories of it. And here you've got them listed. Egypt, Trace, Macedonia, and Syria. And the generals are Ptolemy, Lysitchmus, Cassander, Seleucid. Those are the generals that took over his empire. They didn't always get along either. Now, what does Daniel see coming out of one of the four winds of heaven? Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the present <coughs> land. A little horn. Now this is the same little horn that we've been looking at in Daniel 7, but it also has a dual application here, as we're going to see. And it became strong. Um, Maybe I'll show you this. Notice where he said, verse 9, Out of one of them came a little horn, wax great, toward the south, east, and the pleasant land. The pleasant land would be where God's people were. And so this horn, this power, would ultimately come against to exalt itself over God's people. And we're going to see that application in the two powers it represents. Who does the little horn stand up against? Verse 23 through 25. In the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding and darn sentence shall come up. Verse 23 through 25. And this power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. See, persecuting God's people. And through this policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of peace, but he shall be broken without hand. Who would this power stand up against? Prince of Peace, that's Christ. Prince of Princes. Oh, Prince of Princes, sorry. <laughs> prince of Princes, yes. Stand up against the Prince of Princes. So in, in these verses, now 8 to 12, Daniel 8, we see pagan Rome evolving into papal Rome. And that's what this little horn has a dual meaning, and we're going to see how they how it applies. Uh, Prince of Peace, Christ, or Prince of Princes, uh, as the scripture said. Uh, pagan Rome and Papal Rome both came against Christ. Now, let's notice here. Yes. <clears throat> In Daniel 8 9, mm -hmm. it says, Now of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Right. Can you? That would be Israel against God's, God's people. They thought that. Yeah, yeah. Now, does this little horn stay a little horn? Verse 10. And then wax great even to the host of heaven, and it casts down some of the host and of the stars of the ground and stamped upon them. So, no, he waxed great. 
So the Roman Empire, which is the first application, became strong. And then the Papal Rome, the Papal Empire became strong. As the Pagan Roman Empire went down in power, the Papal Roman Empire came up in power. As the little horn wax great, what five things did it do? Verse 11 and 12. Yea, he magnified, even, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the two to the ground, it practiced and prospered. Got a whole list of things. He magnified himself to the prince of the host, and that's Christ. By him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. If you look at this word daily in the Hebrew, it's referring to the permanent features of the sanctuary. And so it's talking about the sanctuary service and all being done, taken away. The place of the sanctuary was cast down. It cast down the truth to the ground. Practiced and prospered. Now, this applies to the Roman Empire and to the Papal Roman Empire. The Pagan Roman, Papal Roman. We're going to see that here. Now, the Pagan Roman Empire magnified itself against Christ. It was under the authority of Rome that Christ was crucified. The earthly sanctuary services and buildings were destroyed, right? 70 AD by the Roman Empire. It opposed the truth of God's word. Remember they had emperor worship. Christians were persecuted. And it prospered, <coughs> prospered in power. That's the pagan Roman Empire. So we see everything it says it did, it did. Now you look at papal Roman Empire. Magnify itself against the prince of the host. Again, it taught doctrines to replace Christ. And we looked at some of those. The, the daily, all features of the sanctuary truth eliminated. Um, okay, let's look at the services and the Christ. Who is our priest that we go to for forgiveness? Jesus, Jesus Christ. He has been replaced by an earthly priest, right? In, in the papal system. They would think so. You go to the earthly priest to get forgiveness. Um, when you look at the sanctuary service, Christ is, you know, when we celebrate communion, uh, the bread and the wine, the, the bread symbolic of his body and all, they replace and say, no, no, the bread is Christ. It's a substitute. The bread's not Christ. The bread is symbolic of Christ. So it's a substitute again. Um, you look at the, um, in the sanctuary was the, uh, the candlesticks. And the candlesticks represent Christ, the light of the world, and also God's word. God's word is light, bright, truth, the lamp unto my feet. Well, they've done away with the candlesticks. Instead of Christ being the light, it's the church and church tradition. There's where you get the light, the truth. And it does away with the Bible. Again, the church tradition. So, when you look at the different features of the sanctuary and its symbolism of Christ, it's, it's been done away with. And, and so the daily features of sanctuary truth eliminated and did away with sanctuary truth, taught church tradition of the Bible, practiced and prospered. And so it's interesting that the papal Rome has done everything that pagan Rome did. Pagan Rome did it in its way, and papal Rome has done it in its way. So it's, that little horn has dual application. As Daniel contemplates all that he has seen in vision, what questions did he ask? Verse 13. 
<laughs> and I heard one saint speak, and another saint said unto that certain saint, who spoke, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So how long should be the vision? How long would it be? And notice the question. How long, verse 13, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? And then talks about to give both the sanctuary and host tribe under foot. How long will the sanctuary truth be lost? Papal Rome has done away with the sanctuary truth. And all the focus is on the church, on the human priest, on church tradition, praying to Mary, all of these substitutes. And the question of this, how long will the sanctuary truth that's been cast down and trodden down, how long will that be? That's the question. <clears throat> And how long would it be? Verse 14. And he said unto me, In the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It would be 2,300 days. And we know in prophecy, a day is a year, but we look at that. And when it says sanctuary cleansed, the cleansing has a, a couple of facets to it. One, it has to be a meaning of putting it in its rightful place. It's been cast down, but it's going to be put back in its rightful place, its rightful condition, and it also carries on and added an, an idea of, uh, when you look at the Old Testament, there was a day when they did the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I won't get into that tonight. We will look at that later. Does the Bible support the use of day for a year in prophecy? And over here in Ezekiel, you're in Daniel, so go back. Ezekiel 4.6. We've had this principle before. And when you have accomplished them, lie again on your right side, and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days, and I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in Bible prophecy, not in history, but in Bible prophecy, a day in prophecy is a year in reality. And remember, we looked at that in the past. We had a 1,260-year prophecy, remember? Uh, we looked at that quite a bit in Daniel 7 and also Revelation 12 and 13. So, what is Daniel told about the vision of the evening and the morning? Daniel 8, 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up you the vision, for it shall be for many days. In other words, it wasn't going to happen in Daniel's time. So he said, shut up the vision, close it up. It won't be fulfilled in your, in your life. It's going to be many days in the future when it gets fulfilled. Why didn't God give Daniel an interpretation on the other days at this time? Verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Daniel was, I think, he was so overwhelmed by this. He knew that this was a prophecy that didn't bode well for what was going to happen to God's truth and God's people in the future. And Daniel loved God and God's people and God's truth. So it's kind of overwhelming to him. He fainted with six certain days. Now we go to the next chapter. And what is Daniel doing when <coughs> chapter 9 opens? Verses 1 to 3. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asareas, the of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, 
understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to, Jerusalem, to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Remember God prophesied God's people would go into Babylon captivity for 70 years. So he's saying, I, I recall that from the book of Jeremiah, from Jeremiah's writings. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So Daniel sought the Lord in prayer and supplication. For those of you that have heard me preach on prayer, right here is a clear example. Prayer gives God the right of passage to do what he wants to do. Um, Daniel knew that God had prophesied through Jeremiah that Israel would turn back to Jerusalem after the 70 years. So what did Daniel do? He prayed. Why did he pray? He knew he had to pray and ask God to do what he said he'd do. Because prayer gives God permission or the right of passage to carry out his will. And you see that in the Lord's Prayer when Christ said, When you pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Remember the next phrase? Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Why did Jesus ask us to pray to the Father that his will be done on earth? Because it won't be done on earth unless we ask him. So prayer is absolutely essential for us in our own personal life, in the advancement of God's cause. So that's what you see happening here. And Daniel's got a beautiful prayer of repentance. So Daniel was praying for God to fulfill his word that Israel would return. Who appeared to Daniel in answer to his prayer? Let's go to verse 20 and 21. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in the prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly, swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So Gabriel came whom I had seen in the beginning. He's talking about chapter 8, when Gabriel talked to him about the vision of chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Now notice verse 22. What is the purpose for Gabriel's visit at this time? He said in verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, and com the commandment came forth. And I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So why did Gabriel come? He came to give Daniel understanding. So he could understand the vision. What vision? The vision of chapter 8. Because there was still part of the vision not interpreted. The part that had to do with the sanctuary. The rest of it had been. That part had been interpreted. So, kind of laying out these points, there has been no new vision since the vision of the Triniator Days. The Triniator Days was the only thing not explained in chapter 8. The rest of the prophecy was explained. The same angel came, the same angel that appeared in chapter 8 appears in chapter 9, Gabriel. Daniel's now told to understand the prophecy. The only vision to be understood was the vision of the 200 days. Therefore, Daniel 9.24 and onward would be the logical place to find the interpretation of the 2000 days. 
So now he's taken up where he left off. So let's look at this part of the prophecy. <laughs> Daniel 9.24. How much time of the 2300 days was determined or cut off from the Jewish people? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish this transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So how much time? Seventy weeks. Seventy weeks. When are the 70 week and 20 day prophecy to begin? 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, is Christ, shall be seven weeks and three score two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So, when, uh, when are they to begin? From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now remember, this is future for Daniel. But there would come a command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's when the 20th day prophecy would begin and the 70 week part would begin. Begin at the same time there. And that is a historical date 457 B.C. You can, you can read about that degree in Ezra and um, in 457 Artaxerxes gave forth the decree that the Jews could go back to Jerusalem and they started rebuilding Jerusalem. You remember the story of Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the wall and all that? Okay, that's what this is all about. So they began building, they went back in 457 B.C. To restore Jerusalem. And so you've got seven weeks. Remember, it said seven weeks and three score and two weeks. You see that in the last part of verse 25? He says, um, Know therefore and understand it from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem to the Messiah. The prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So you got the seven weeks, that takes you to 457. And then, finishing it out, what would happen at the end of the first 69 weeks? This is verse 25. 925, what would happen at the end of the first 69 weeks? Oh, Messiah. Yeah, Messiah, unto the Messiah. Know there and understand that from the going for the command, based toward build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. So it's predicting the coming of Jesus. That there would be, notice how long? Seven weeks and three score. How much is the score? 20. 20. So three twenties is 60. Plus seven weeks plus two. And two. So 60 and 2, 62, and 7 more is 69. 69, right? So you've got 69 weeks of the 70. So let's look at this. The Messiah of the Prince would come at the end of the 69 weeks. So you've got 457, then it takes you to 408. That's the seven weeks. And then you've got an added 62 weeks. And it takes you to 27 AD. And it said the Messiah should appear then. And that is the baptismal date of Jesus. That's when Jesus became the anointed one. Because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Remember? That's when he began his public ministry. This was the prophecy that convinced me there's a God and the Bible is his word. <laughs> no man could come up with this. This was predicted hundreds of years before it ever happened 
And God actually predicted the actual baptism of Jesus. Yes? I don't get it. Is it, I, is it a score? That's okay. This is a tough one. <laughs> let's I, let's go back to that. 20 years? Is it yeah, let's go back to that verse 25. I he thought said, scores were years. Pardon? I thought scores were years, like 20 scores. So, I, I, I thought 20 score was 20 years. A score? Yeah. A score. A score is 20. Score. Yeah, but isn't it in years? I thought it was in years, not weeks. Or is it just... You're, you're basically going to break it down to days. A score is only the numbers. Yeah. yeah, we're just breaking it down to days. So a score just means 20. It could be 20 years. It could be 20 days. It could 20. be 20 whatever. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's it. A... You got it? Okay, good. So we've got a total of... A total of 60, uh, 69, but they're showing you just this part of it. From 408 to 62 weeks takes you to the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, not the crucifixion, the baptism of Jesus, 27 AD. And it happened right then. What is the first message that Jesus announces after his baptism? Mark 1. We'll be back here in Daniel, so you don't want to leave your hand there. Mark 1, verse 14, 15. Now after that, John was put in prison, and Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you, therefore, repent and believe the gospel. So what did Jesus say? Time is fulfilled. What time? This prophecy. See that? He knew this prophecy. The prophecy is fulfilled. Time is fulfilled. He's baptized. He's coming forth now as the anointed one. The Holy Spirit came down and he begins his public ministry. What is ultimately to happen to the Messiah? Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, now what happened at the three score and two weeks? Jesus was what? Baptized. After the three score and two weeks. Shall Messiah be cut off? So sometime after his baptism, he'd be cut off. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war does laser determine. So, what ultimately would happen to Messiah? He would be cut off. Sometime after his baptism, he would be cut off. Crucified. But he says here, not for himself, right? Who's he dying for? Us. Okay, now notice verse 27. How long does the Messiah confirm the covenant with the Jews? Verse 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, you shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. For all this overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Let's study the first part here. He'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. You got one week. That's your answer there. One week is what? Seven days? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got seven years. What does the Messiah do in the midst of the week? Notice verse 27. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. When Jesus died on the cross, do you and I need an animal sacrifice anymore? No. He ended the sacrificial system. He ended the sanctuary service, the earthly one. And it said in the midst of the week. So you got 27 and three and a half years takes you to 31, and then you go to 34. There's your seven years, one week, seven years, 
Three and a half years. So his ministry lasted three and a half years from his baptism. So he was baptized in 27, crucified in 31. Exactly what he said would happen. Remember they tried to kill him before? Oh, yeah. Couldn't do it. But then when the time, you know, he said, remember he said, my time is not yet come? Mm -hmm. He knew this. <laughs> Wasn't time yet. But when the time came, nobody could stop it. That's how it is with God, by the way. Is he saw it. The time came for Christ to be crucified. His hour had come. <clears throat> That's it. He was crucified. And then there was another three and a half years, the full week. And what happened in 34 AD, you can read about it in the book of Acts, the stoning of Stephen. Christ gave them three and a half years since the crucifixion to preach to the Jews. Remember he said, preach the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, <coughs> first, <coughs> and then the other parts of the world. So the gospel first went to the Jews, and many Jews accepted the gospel. However, a persecution broke out in 34 AD. And the Christians were severely persecuted, and they had to get out of it. And the Christians were dispersed. And the gospel went to the Gentiles. And that's when the Christian church became the Christian church. Before, it was just more or less like a, a sect of Judaism. No way. As people looked at it. But as time went on, it became clear that there's the Christian church and there's Judaism. And that started happening in 34 AD. Now, I want you to go back to verse 24. And I want to point out some things to you. Here's the 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined up your people and upon the holy city. To finish the transgression, that means to fill up their cup of sin. The story of Stephen. The gospel went to the Jews as a nation and the people and they rejected it. To make an end of sin, to spread the sin offerings. Jesus ended the sin offerings at the crucifixion. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Well, that's what the gospel is all about, right? To bring in everlasting righteousness. You and I can be righteous, right? When did Christ develop or generate that righteousness when he walked this earth? So that was during that period. To seal up the vision and prophecy. This is the seal of all prophecy. If this had not taken place, no other prophecy would happen. Everything hinged on this. This is a seal. Confirmation of all prophecy. And to anoint the most holy, that can refer to a person or place. Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his water baptism. So everything took place within that 70 week period, as God said. When does the 100 day prophecy end? Daniel 8 14. Let's go back, look at Daniel 8 14. And he said unto me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So you got 2,300 days. You add that up, there's a, I don't know if you, I guess you can see that. Uh, you got the decree. See if my pointer works. 457, the restore build Jerusalem. Seven weeks, wall complete. Another 62 weeks, take shot 27, the baptism of Jesus. You got one week, seven days, three in the midst of the week, sacrifice cease, the crucifixion, 31 AD. And at the end of the 70th, the one week here, or the 70 weeks, is stoning of Stephen and the gospel to the world. Now you go out to the full 2300 years or days, 1844. That's what it adds up to. 1844. Actually, October 22. So, that's what we've been looking at.
and it said there'd be the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Remember, there's no earthly sanctuary at that time, right? When Christ left earth, where did he go? Heavenly sanctuary. What is his mission there? What is he called? Our high priest. So there's a priestly work being done in the heavenly sanctuary. Very important work being done there. And in 1844, the work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary began. That's what this prophecy tells us. What was to happen in that time? We just saw it here. The, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We won't get into that tonight. We're getting through this one in an hour. <laughs> so, in order to understand what took place in 1844, we need to study what the Bible says about the sanctuary. What the sanctuary is. Daniel 8.14 tells us that at this time the sanctuary will be cleansed. The next two lessons, we've got two lessons on this. We'll give the amazing details of what happened in 1844. And you think what the Bible predicted so clearly about this is Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, got two response questions for you. Number one, on your little card there, quiz card. If this lesson was clear and made sense to you, please put it number one with a circle. And number two, if you are thankful that Jesus Christ came on time and died on time and want to renew your commitment to Him as your Savior and Lord, circle number two. Now, you remember you're going to get a break. <laughs> and uh, this is the last one until Monday night, July 9. That's the week after 4th of July. So don't forget that. July 9, and then our Wednesday one, of course, will be July 11. And then we'll continue as we are every Monday and Wednesday. Okay. Any questions on the schedule? Is that clear? You see what we're going to do? Okay. Let's have prayer, and then we'll give you out the lesson. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study tonight. Lord, I, I know this is one of those prophecies that's got detail in it. But Lord, it also is a prophecy that reassures us that you truly are a sovereign God that foresees all things. And that you laid out the plan of salvation back in eternity, the everlasting covenant to save us. And that step by step, year by year, century by century, you've been carrying out that plan of salvation. <coughs> As we saw tonight, Lord, in great detail, everything took place just like you foretold of the coming of the Messiah, the baptism is crucifixion, and the gospel to the world. We thank you for calling each of us to know Jesus, and I pray that you will continue to put in our hearts the love of the truth, as we read earlier tonight. Open our hearts and minds to continue to learn as your Spirit guides us through the truths of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.